Don't miss all the fun and excitement on ABC. Take a look. Hello, I'm Michael Gaddy. You may be asking yourself, who's that? Well, I'm the guy who's been making all these Disneyland and Disney Park history videos. First, I'd like to say thank you to all those who've watched the hours upon hours of videos, like, shared, subscribed, and commented. You may also be wondering, what happened to all the videos from 1989 to 2001? Those are on their way, and the next video will be Disneyland 1989 and hopefully into the 90s. But these videos keep getting longer as we go further through time because the Walt Disney Company promoted their parks and attractions more and more as time went on. Lastly, you don't usually hear my voice. Well, I wanted to do something unique for Disney California Adventure Park for a few reasons. The most obvious reason being that February 8th, 2021 will be the 20th anniversary of the park. I'm not sure when this video will be up. My intention is for it to be published on the 8th. But with all the work I put into these videos, I'm sure I'll probably be late. Also, another reason I'm focusing so much on the subject is because of its personal connection with myself. I am a California Adventure cast member and have been since 2009. I, like so many, haven't been to work since March of last year, and it makes me very sad to know that I won't be there for DCA's 20th. My first visit to the park was in 2006, so I was there just after its 5th anniversary. I worked at the park during its 10th and its 15th anniversary, so it's especially sad that I'm going to be missing it. In lieu of being there, I thought it would be fun to not only celebrate the history of the park, but its origin. Disney California Adventure, or as it was called in 2001, Disney's California Adventure, is the result of many failed ideas dating back to the days of Walt himself. So not only will this video have the typical clips produced by Disney and others with my fun fact subtitles, but every now and again, I'll step in and talk about Disney history while showing you clips, pictures, and news articles. So sit back and enjoy what I hope will be my favorite Disneyland history video. First, I want to give a quick background of how Disney got to the year 1990. Why 1990? Because that's where the story of Disney's California adventure truly begins. Eisner, the Walt Disney Company, and the Disney Imagineers were at their peak and felt they could do no wrong. Yeah! Kind of like Walt Disney in 1938 when Snow White was a giant success. I don't want to go too far into this because I am working on another video of how Walt went from a farm boy in Missouri to a Hollywood Titan to building an amusement park in the random town of Anaheim, and someday that will come out and you'll get all that information. What I will say is when Disneyland was built, Walt put every penny he had into the park. He bought just enough land. So when Disneyland became successful, everyone else bought all the land around the Disney property and flooded it with hotels, motels, and Denny's. Harbor Boulevard looked like a cheap and tacky Vegas. So when he bought land for Disney World, he made sure to buy more land than he'd ever use. Twice the size of the island of Manhattan. When building Disneyland in 1954, Walt couldn't afford to build his own hotel, so he turned to friend and television producer Jack Rather. Jack was reluctant at first, but Walt gave him the rights to build any Disney-branded hotel in the state of California for the next hundred years. Jack loved the idea, although he quickly realized that a Disney hotel didn't mean anything without a Disney park next to it. I've heard rumors that Walt considered building something called California living in the south end of the parking lot of Disneyland, right about where Pixar Pier is today. Jim Hill, Disney historian, once mentioned it on a podcast, and I've only found one article on the website DisneyHistoryInstitute.com. It sounded like downtown Disney meets Epcot's World Showcase, but California themed, of course. The themed areas would have included the beach, the mountains, the desert, and the city. For more detail, I'll, I'll leave a link in the description. 
Walt gave up on the idea of California living because he became way too busy with his dream project of Epcot, a city of the future, at the permanent world's fair we have today. Walt and his Imagineers focused everything on Florida. But when Walt passed, the company had to settle with just making a larger version of Disneyland in the Magic Kingdom of Walt Disney World in 1971 and the World's Fair version of Epcot in 1982. Because the company lost their captain and Walt's brother in 1971, every department of Walt Disney Productions was lost at sea. They spent most of the time trying to guess what Walt would have done, and that meant staying stagnant. In Disney's all-new Herbie Goes Bananas. The two new parks were successful, but only at first. The recession hurt the touring business, and Disney's inability to grow with their audience put the company in financial ruin and faced potential corporate takeover. Roy E. Disney, Walt's nephew, got the current CEO, Walt's son-in-law, removed and had him replaced by Michael Leisner, and Frank Wells from Warner Brothers took the position of company president. Eisner and Wells were a partnership that resembled Walt and his brother Roy. Walt was the creative lead of the company, like Eisner, and Roy was the financial head, like Wells. Also, both Wells and Roy kept their creative counterpart in check and made sure they didn't go too far off the edge when it came to any of their ideas. Eisner and Wells, with the help of Jeffrey Katzenberg and Roy E. Disney, revitalized Disney's movie studio. Disney enjoyed the success of live action films in the mid to late 80s, and then the sublime success of animation, starting with Who Framed Roger Rabbit and The Little Mermaid. When Michael first visited Imagineering, he was like a kid in a toy store. He must have felt like God with absolute power to create. He brought in friends like George Lucas to consult on park attractions like Star Tours and Captain EO, both raising park attendants. But it was an idea that he likely borrowed from his days at Paramount when Universal met with Eisner's then employer, asking for a financial partnership for Universal Studios Florida. Imagineers already had an idea for what would become the Great Movie Ride, but Eisner wanted an entire park that was basically what Universal had in mind, a theme park and a working production studio. In 1988, Disney bought out the Rather Corporation, so they would finally own the Disneyland Hotel and the rights to build Disney hotels in California. This also meant they own the Queen Mary and its surrounding areas. Rather also own the Lone Ranger, and Disney did nothing with that until 2013, and now they'll never do anything with it again. On May 1st, 1989, Disney MGM Studios opened at Walt Disney World Resort. Also around that time, Disney opened two hotels on the Florida property, Pleasure Island, a shopping, dining, and clubbing district, and Typhoon Lagoon, a fully-fledged Disney water park. Walt Disney World was now a resort that required at least a week's stay and didn't require you to leave the property while you were there. It fulfilled all your vacation needs, and this expansion was a huge success. For Disney, the 1980s began at the company's lowest point since the World War II era, but ended with colossal success in every department of the company. So like I said, Eisner and the Imagineers felt they can do no wrong. In late 1989, Eisner announced that the 1990s would be the Disney decade. Ten years of company growth, especially in the theme parks. Disney's 10-year plan will include at least 25 major additions to theme parks in both California and Florida. Florida expansion plans include doubling the size of the MGM theme park and adding another international pavilion to Epcot Center. The changes come as California's Disneyland celebrates its 35th anniversary, and our Steve Overton, of course, is in Anaheim amidst mm -hmm. all the excitement. He's quite happy out there. Let's oh, find okay. out if it's nicer out there than it is here, or, or our park is better. Yeah. Which one, which one Steve? You know, it's funny, folks, because you kind of hear that question a lot when you're out here, and of course the only one you can ask is someone who's been to both parks, and I'm working so much of the time it's hard to make a guess. But how about if I share with you a couple of opinions that we heard comparing Disneyland to Disney World? Disney World is a lot bigger. Uh, just and it has Epcot. More spread out, and it has Epcot. There's more to do with Disney World, though, and I also went to Epcot, so that's one drawback of out here. They don't have Epcot out here, but other than that, it's, pretty, it's very similar. Of course, Disney World is much bigger. They got a lot more property out there. But hey, forget all that because so many new plans are in the works for both of the parks. Wes, you mentioned them on your business briefs just a few seconds ago. And we heard about all the rest of it today from Disney Chief Michael Eisner. Out that Disneyland will never be complete as long as there is imagination left in the world. Eisner announced at a packed news conference that Disneyland will get beefed up during the next 10 years and is even going to get a brand new sister theme park nearby. 
Eisner says Disneyland will borrow from the success of Disney MGM Studios in Orlando, adding Mickey Starland, very much like Mickey's birthday land in the Magic Kingdom, where kids meet the famous mouse and visit his house. And Disneyland will get its own version of the studio's Indiana Jones epic stunt theater. Plus, the Anaheim Park will build Hollywood Land, a version of Hollywood Boulevard from Disney MGM featuring shops, restaurants, and atmosphere from the golden age of the movies. And as far as the brand new theme park here in California, Eisner says it hasn't been decided what kind of park it will be. He also announced that the size of Disney MGM Studios in Florida will double over the next decade. You know, that's going to be incredible because I've been over to Disney MGM and it is kind of a small, quaint park compared to the rest of them over there at Disney World. But it isn't that small. I mean, it's going to take you the whole day to see the whole thing. So I tell you, they're going to open something else at Disney MGM Studios this weekend. They're going to open the Star Tours ride. You know, there's already one of those here at Disneyland. Now we're going to get our own in Florida. The Swan Grand Opening was just one of the events of the weekend when Eisner announced broad plans to expand Disneyland in California and Walt Disney World here. Magic Kingdom will get the Matterhorn, a roller coaster ride, and Splash Mountain. Both of them are hits at Disneyland. Epcot Center will get Soviet and Swiss pavilions. And Disney MGM will double in size, getting several new shows, including one featuring Kermit the Frog and the rest of Jim Henson's Muppets. Hello, Mr. Eisner. Uh, Kermit, please yes. call me Michael. Michael. Oh, Michael. Oh, well, certainly, Michael. Well, all the Muppets are really excited to be working here, Michael. Well, how's... And, uh, I think it's going to be really great. Uh, Mike, can I call you Mike? Uh... Anything. Okay, well, Her. Mike, it's, yeah, it's going to be great, Mike. How's the new show? Every existing park was promised new attractions and expansions. Eisner wanted a fourth park in Florida, a second park in Tokyo and France, which was under construction at the time, both to be a clone of the Disney MGM Studios park, and a second park in California. But instead of announcing one park for California, Disney announced two. As seen in the video, whether prompted or not, guests were sad that Disneyland didn't have its own Epcot. But that was the plan for a second gate on the Disneyland property, a West Coast version of Epcot named Westcott. Known as the greatest Disney theme park never built, Westcott would have been located where Disney California Adventure is now, the former parking lot of Disneyland. Like Epcot, Westcott would have had two sections of the park, Future World and the World Showcase. The icon of the park would have been Space Station Earth, similar to the globe of Epcot, but Spaceship Earth at Epcot has the diameter of 180 feet, the same as the Ferris wheel of California Adventure. The proposed Space Station Earth would have been 300 feet, and it also would have been gold and reflective. The locals complained when they heard about Disney's plan, so it was changed to a giant spire. The reason was Epcot was the spear, Westcott would have been the spire, and the two together would have resembled the icon of the 1939 New York World's Fair. Although when I see the concept for the spire, it looks very religious or cult-like. Guests would then enter through Ventureport to visit one of the three pavilions, the Wonders of Earth, the Wonders of Life, and the Wonders of Space. Some of the proposed clone attractions for Future World would have been Horizons, World of Motion, Journey into Imagination, Universe of Energy, The Living Sea, and The Land. Unlike Epcot's World Showcase, where each pavilion is a specific country, Westcott's World Showcase would have been the four corners of the world. The World Showcase pavilion looked to be somewhere in between the pavilions of Epcot or Disney's Animal Kingdom that opened in 1998. The World of Asia would have featured a roller coaster called Ride the Dragon that went through the Dragon's Teeth Mountains, similar to the mountains of Disneyland. The World of Africa's main attraction would have been a river rafting ride and an exhibit about farming. The Old World would have had the Trans-European Express, a James Bond-style car chase. The New World would have been how you entered the park, starting with a companion to Main Street USA. Despite being referred to as the Americas, the New World would only feature the three North American countries, especially Mexico. The main attraction, however, would have been an updated version of the American Adventure from Epcot. These seven pavilions would have been called the Seven Wonders of Westcott and a boat would shuttle guests throughout the park. It had many stops in every pavilion, but if you wanted to take the Grand Circle Tour, it would have taken 45 minutes. The park would have been only the main attraction of the new Disneyland Resort, a shopping and dining district that would eventually devolve into Anaheim's Downtown Disney. 
It was to be located in the same general area as downtown Disney. What Disney wanted was a seaside, boardwalk-like atmosphere with a large body of water included. It even featured a replica of the Catalina Casino in Avalon, California. Around where the Toy Story parking lot shuttles drop off guests, Disney planned for an amphitheater that would have seated 5,000 people, and during the day Disney could have used this theater as part of the theme park, but at night they would have locked the doors between the theater and the park and opened the exterior doors and had concerts and shows that required a separate ticket. The hotel district would have been where the Disneyland Hotel and the Paradise Pier Hotel are today. We're part of the Mickey and Friends parking structure and Stitch parking ladder today, the Magic Kingdom Hotel would have been. It was modeled after the Santa Barbara Mission. The original Disneyland Hotel would have been renovated, and south of that, where the Paradise Pier Hotel and Simba parking lot is today, would have been the Westcott Lake Hotel with 800 rooms and influenced by the Beverly Hills Hotel. Right about where the buildings of Downtown Disney's AMC Theater, ESPN Zone, Rainforest Cafe are, and where Disney was recently planning on building another hotel until Anaheim said, no thank you. There were plans for the new Disneyland Resort Hotel. Confused? That's right, there was going to be the Disneyland Hotel and the new Disneyland Resort Hotel. The new Disneyland Resort Hotel would have had 800 rooms and like the Grand Floridian in Florida, would have been influenced by the Hotel del Coronado in San Diego. At the Disneyland Resort, Disney would have owned 4,600 hotel rooms, which I assume includes the rooms in the World Showcase Pavilion of Westcott. See, each night you could have stayed in a different region of the world. The hub of the Disneyland Resort would have been the Disneyland Plaza. Today it's known as the Esplanade and it is little more than concrete, an aged compass thing, cobblestones with names of people who have donated money decades ago, and ticket booths. But the Disneyland Plaza was intended to be seven acres featuring a lush garden and a fountain. The fountain itself was still in concept art for the Esplanade in the late 90s. As I said, the plaza was the hub of the resort. All guests were transported from one of three parking structures by people mover or elevated moving sidewalks. The monorails would also travel all over the resort, making several stops at Tomorrowland, between Westcott and Disneyland Center, near the plaza, and at the Disneyland Hotel, and at the Westcott Lake Hotel. This concept of practical uses for the people mover and the monorail would have made Walt very proud. One of the things that Walt despised the most was the tacky look of the surrounding area of Disneyland. Once the park became a must attraction, everyone and their mother tried to capitalize on it by opening hotels and restaurants as close to the park as possible, especially on Harbor Boulevard. Signs grew like trees competing with each other, trying to be seen by tourists not only on Harbor Boulevard or the nearby freeway, but by guests inside Disneyland. So part of the renovation of the Disneyland Resort was to renovate the surrounding area. This meant taking down all the tall signs and replacing them with street level signage. It also meant replacing all the telephone poles and power lines with palm trees. As I said, Disney had plans for three parking structures. One would have gone about the same spot they tried to build a structure in recent history, a parking lot once called Pumba. They even recently bought and demolished a hotel on Harbor Boulevard in order to have a pedestrian walkway from the structure to the Esplanade. But then Anaheim business owner said, no thank you. All three structures would have had exclusive freeway off-ramps, which is a feature of the Mickey and Friends parking. This meant that guests would enter the parking structure from the freeway, park, get onto a people mover or moving sidewalk and be taken directly to the Disneyland Plaza, where you can either go to one of the two Disney parks, one of the Disney hotels, or the Disney-owned shopping and dining district, never having to go near any of those pesky Anaheim citizen-owned hotels, shops, or restaurants. And in California, planning continues on the Disneyland Resort, a master-planned community of parks, hotels, and shops. The highlight of the new Disney Resort will be Westcott Center, where guests will experience firsthand the excitement of the future and the history of people and cultures from around the world. At Westcott Center, families will be able to live inside the park, staying in uniquely themed resort hotels. The Queen Mary became a permanent resident of the city of Long Beach in December of 1967. A few years later, she became a popular tourist attraction. Jack Rather, the man who built the Disneyland Hotel, loved the ship because of all the fond memories he and his wife had on it when it was still functioning. So he signed a 66-year lease with the city of Long Beach to manage the ship and its surrounding area. Rather was also once friends with Howard Hughes, so in 1981, 
he brought in the infamous aviator's H-4 Hercules flying boat, more commonly referred to as the Spruce Goose, and had a dome built around it. After Disney bought the Rather Company's holdings, they became responsible for the Long Beach attraction. I've heard rumors that in the late 1980s, Disney was intending on possibly buying the SeaWorld parks when its parent company was struggling financially. Imagineers began to think of ways of converting the aquatic theme parks to something up to the Disney standard. They came to the conclusion that it would be easier to build their own SeaWorld, and what better place to put it than their brand new shoreline property. Port Disney would have been a unique concept for Disney. Port Disney would have been home to five hotels for a total of 3,900 rooms. It would have been the Port Hotel, the Canal Hotel, designed after the former Virginia Hotel of Long Beach, the Marina Hotel, which is now the parking lot east of the Long Beach Convention Center, Tidelands Hotel, now the Pike Outlets, and the Shoreline Hotel, where the Long Beach Aquarium is now. The Shoreline Hotel would have also been surrounded by the shopping and dining district of Port Disney. Part of the plan features a cruise ship port years before Disney Cruise Line launched. But of course the centerpiece of Port Disney was to be the theme park named Disney Sea. Disney described the park as Disney style rides, shows and attractions with activities directed towards developing a better understanding of the sea. Imagineers explore the myths, romance, challenges and mysteries of the ocean. The park's icon would have been Oceana. The architectural focal point of the park would rise above the center of Disney Sea in a series of futuristic bubbles, luring guests to a fascinating evolutionary journey th through the world's seas. Guests would walk through a state-of-the-art two-story aquarium. Inside Oceana was something called the Future Research Center. It was to be a working laboratory similar to the Living Seas Pavilion in Epcot. But the park wasn't only about education. It would have featured other lands like Mysterious Island, at Mysterious Island, guests would discover the lost city of Atlantis on a modern version of a Disneyland E attraction. Children could follow clues to buried treasure on Pirate Island, while the more intrepid might dare to board Nemo's lava cruiser and Kareem's suspended through dangerous caverns. Mysterious Island would have also had a Jules Verne influence similar to Discoveryland in Paris and the 1998 renovation of California's Tomorrowland. Heroes Harbor was about legends and mythic aquatic adventurers. It would have also featured an aqua labyrinth, a maze where the walls were made of water. Then there was the boardwalk and fleets of fancy. The boardwalk was modeled after the Pike, a former amusement park in Long Beach that was located just north of the proposed Port Disney site. On the edge of the bay facing downward, a boardwalk would recreate the nostalgia of the Long Beach oceanfront in its heyday. Nearby at Fleets of Fancy, a harbor full of fabled and fanciful ships, including oversized Chinese junks and Egyptian galleys, would disguise existing rides and dining and entertainment experiences. Shoppers and diners will be intrigued by Disney Sea's themed environments, a Grecian village, an Asian water market, a Caribbean lagoon. Your guests might be seen surfing, snorkeling, or wading through tropical reefs teeming with fish. Some will experience the ultimate underwater adventure, being lowered into a steel cage into a tank full of sharks. If built, Port Disney would have opened in the year 2000. In the year 2000. Now you may be asking, why two parks in California? Could Disney really afford both while building an entire resort in France and beginning to work on a new theme park in Florida and Tokyo? To put it simply, no. Disney didn't intend on building both parks. They wanted a second California gate, but Eisner wanted Long Beach or Anaheim to decide where by having them fight for the privilege of a new Disney theme park. Unfortunately for him, neither really did. Both projects would have required about a billion dollars to improve and build new roads to accommodate access to the resorts and lessen traffic, build parking facilities, and build off ramps from freeways to said parking. While both city leaders loved the idea of bringing in more tourists, each city's residents pushed back, especially in Long Beach. In order to complete plans in Long Beach, Disney would have to reclaim land. This means pouring earth into the bay. Disney Sea would sit on this new land, an area that is still water today. This would have dramatically altered the ecosystem of the area. Then there was the promise of jobs. Who would the jobs have gone to? How much would these jobs pay? Will all the jobs be entry level? And the biggest concern of Long Beach residents, will these new cast members reflect the diverse population of Long Beach? Because even in 1991, most Disney cast members were white 
and attractive. Disney had strict guidelines because they wanted the guest experience to be completely immersive, and if a cast member didn't look like Barbie or Ken, it might take them out of the show. Or at least, that was the perception of Disneyland and the park's hiring staff. At the time, Long Beach was just over half minority. They feared they would import blondes from Huntington Beach, as one resident put it. Many Long Beach residents failed to get jobs at Disneyland because of not meeting standards like reliable transportation given the local poverty level. The question of positions available was broached. Most managers are promoted from within the company. This means that when a new park is open, experienced Disney leaders transfer to the park. So not every new job will be available to everyone off the street. Another concern was with all the new nautical traffic going in and out of the resort, thanks to several docks and sea taxis, and the land traffic around the resort, how will it affect the port of Long Beach? Many businesses depend on cargo that arrives at the port and then is driven by trucks throughout the American Southwest, but if it became too busy, they might redirect said cargo as far north as San Francisco. This would mean losing jobs at the Long Beach port, held by Long Beach residents. So potentially more local jobs would be lost than would be gained by the new resort. Also, the entire project would have cost $3 billion. That's in 1991 money. Today, that'd be about $5.7 billion. In December of 1991, Disney canceled their plans for Port Disney, and on March 6, 1982, Disney canceled their lease for the Queen Mary and its surrounding area. Originally, Disney presented the Port Disney and Disneyland Resort projects as a competition, so when they failed in Long Beach, they declared Anaheim the winner. Literally. They even made buttons. No, I'm not joking. They just failed to bring up that they won by default. The Anaheim mayor was much more excited at the prospect of a Disneyland Resort expansion and a second theme park even if Anaheim residents had reservations. But I have three more things to say about Port Disney. One, Walt made sure Disneyland wasn't too close to the beach because he didn't want guests showing up in their bathing suits. Two, that part of Long Beach would eventually get a seaside attraction in the Long Beach Aquarium where some of the ideas of ocean study and education on sea life would find a home. And third, obviously the name and some of the ideas of Disney Sea were used on the other side of the Pacific with Tokyo Disney Sea, the sister park to Tokyo Disneyland. A much better idea than a Disney MGM Studios clone, and some considered to be the best Disney park in the world. It helps that Disney didn't have to pay for any of it. And that kind of shows what Westcott and Disney Sea and Long Beach could have been if Disney had unlimited funds. On April 12th, 1992, Euro Disneyland opened. As I'm sure you know, it was a superb failure. First, there's the name. To us, especially in the 80s and 90s, the term Euro referred to a chic, exotic, fashionable perception of European culture. To the French, it represents money. And putting money and Disney together in a culture that already sees Americans and the Walt Disney Company as greedy and uncultured and only fed their disdain for what Disney was trying to do in their country. Michael Eisner became too ambitious during the development phase, and the park's budget grew with Eisner's dreaming up newer and more expensive ideas. Also, the European resort had seven hotels with a total of 5,800 rooms. However, French guests preferred to stay at cheaper hotels or their homes in Paris, just 30 minutes west of the park. Euro Disney was also anticipated to have attendance similar to Tokyo and Florida. However, not only do the Japanese love Disney and American culture, Americans and Japanese have far more workdays than Europeans. This means less money to burn on things like overpriced Mickey ears or even tickets to a theme park about your culture made by somebody that they hate. Because that's what the fairy tales are. They're European. How could you build a fake castle where tourists can drive down the street and see a real castle at a far lower price? Euro Disneyland lost a billion dollars in its first year. This hurt Eisner. He took it personally. While Disney MGM was something he pushed for and loved, building his own Disneyland felt more like stepping into Walt Disney's shoes. Euro Disney was the first big failure of the Eisner Wells era. It sent a shockwave through the company, especially the theme park division. Someone suggested that Michael Eisner take a vacation to collect his thoughts and recharge after the European defeat. He went to Colonial Williamsburg. It was there that he was inspired to build an even more ambitious yet cheaper project than Paris.
From WDI Communications, this is the Quarterly Report. I'm Tony Hatch. In this report, you'll learn about the ambitious project the Walt Disney Company intends to open near Washington, D.C., Disney's America. You'll visit the White House to meet President Bill Clinton, the first sitting chief executive to appear in the Hall of Presidents at Walt Disney World. You'll get an update as the Tower of Terror rises in Florida, and you'll go below as the submarine Nautilus sets sail for France. All this coming up on the Quarterly Report as we ring out the 40th anniversary year of Walt Disney Imagineering. When the story finally broke last month, it was one of the biggest in Washington, D.C., a city that has seen its share of major stories. Disney's America. Shrouded in secrecy, the project is to be located southeast of the nation's capital in northern Virginia, near the rural village of Haymarket. It would be the third Disney park in the United States and would open in 1998. The creative team for Disney's America is headed by Senior Vice President Bob Weiss. The idea is to build a regional park. It is not in any way a Walt Disney World or a Disneyland. It is a small scale regional park. And the intent is to build a park which is a fundamental part of what a family's experience of traveling to see Washington, D.C. is going to be about. So if you, if you pack up your family, you go to Washington, D.C., you want to see the monuments, you want to see the Smithsonian, you want to see all the history and all the, the uh, activities of government, um, you're able to see all those things in Washington, but we wanted to build a complement to that where you can come and experience them all, role play in all of them, play an active role, and see and feel and be a part of, of history. Um, so you'll come here, you'll be able to have rides, shows, um, interactive experiences that are both about the history of America, they're about America today, and they're also going to give you a sense of America in the future. Disney's America is divided into nine territories. Crossroads USA is where you enter. It's a Civil War era village reflecting a time when canal boats were still competing with railroads for traffic, when something new called the department store was just making an appearance, and when news moved with the speed of the telegraph. Visitors may stay in hotel rooms outside the berm or in special suites overlooking the canals inside the park. It is from Crossroads USA that visitors can either head forward or backward in time. Heading back into history is President Square, focusing on the struggle of the colonists and the war for independence. A new Hall of Presidents will be located here with its audio animatronics presentation of all our chief executives and the story of the building of the nation. Native America explores the life of this continent's first inhabitants. The Powhatan tribe lived in this area of Virginia and Native America will have an authentically restored village representing that and other eastern tribes. Native America will also feature a Lewis and Clark whitewater raft expedition through whirlpools and rapids. Many historians believe the Civil War was the dividing point in the development of this nation, and it is a Civil War fort which becomes the next guest experience. Historically, it's in the correct location because not many miles from the park is the Manassas Battlefield, also known as Bull Run, where one of the first major battles of the Civil War was fought. Inside the fort, a Circle Vision 360-degree film will put guests in the middle of such a battle, and outside will be staged authentic reenactments of military engagements. At night, the fort will become the backdrop for the classic confrontation between the Monitor and the Merrimack, the two Civil War ironclads that forever changed the way naval battles would be fought. We the People will be a powerful multimedia experience showing the diversity of American culture, all housed inside a building which looks like Ellis Island, New York. The exhibits will also explore subjects like slavery and the Vietnam War. Enterprise is a factory town which will show America's creative spirit from inventions to innovations. The town itself represents the Industrial Revolution, which also happens to be the name of the park's major thrill attraction, a high-speed adventure through a turn-of-the-century mill, culminating in a narrow escape from a fiery vat of molten steel. Victory Field will not only call attention to America's preeminent position in the field of aviation, 
but show how Americans from diverse backgrounds fought to preserve freedom in numerous wars since the founding of the Republic. Victory Field will also have an interactive venue allowing guests to experience flying jet fighters or operating tanks or possibly even parachuting from a plane as part of basic training. State Fair celebrates small town America during the Depression era with its throwback to a wooden roller coaster and Ferris wheel and a ballpark show involving heroes from an earlier era. Finally, there's Family Farm, saluting the American farmer and others who work the land. Crops will be harvested and guests will be invited to participate in cow milking or making ice cream. And for more entertainment, there'll be a country wedding, barn dance and buffet. Again, Bob Weiss. It is somewhat of an extension of what we started to do with the studio tour and what others um, have started to do, had, began with Epcot, which is to combine education and entertainment in a new way and to try to strike a balance between um, a very cognitive, issues-oriented park and something that is still repeatable and fun and interesting and lots of teenagers want to come and ride rides and, and that sort of thing. So that's a challenge. It will be a challenge because we have lots of new historical ground here to cover, um, to research, and to figure out how to sort through the huge um, historical uh, library of what America is about and try to find icons that we can, we can recreate. Um, to, uh, I think a big challenge is going to make sure that we're fair to, to really represent the ethnic diversity of America and the contributions that everyone has made to to this and also to fairly represent things that are negative about America, things that have, have, have been tough issues that, that we either have overcome or have never been able to overcome and are still struggles. If we build a, a uh, nice little park that, that is about American history, we will have failed. And what is most important about this park is we have to go out and build alliances with important groups that, that are, are defining what America is about today or have defined it in the past and represent them well. And those alliances um, and educational alliances are going to make this park have, it, have a lot of breadth to it. Now, you come in, in the midst of this, you open another one. You come into Manassas, Virginia, which is like how far from here? 35 miles? Yeah, 30 doesn't. miles. Right. South. So anybody can drive here from Washington. Hopefully they will. How large an area is this going to be? Well, let's see. Let's put it in context. Uh, Disneyland is about 200 acres. Uh, Euro Disney is about uh, 6,000, 5,000. Walt Disney World is 30,000, twice the size of Manhattan. This is 3,000. So it's bigger than Disneyland in far land size, but it's much smaller than, of course, our operations. Is it near the Civil War uh, ground? It's about five miles from Manassas. Uh, as I went and walked the land, I saw a little sign that said Little Bull Run. Now, I wasn't a history major, but that sounded mm -hmm. magic. It's going to be called Disney's American, right? Disney's America, and it's a obviously an entertainment venue. It's probably the size of the park of, uh, of Disneyland, 100 acres the actual park will be. It's uh, our vision of uh, the patriotic America. It's our vision of what America is, the pluralistic America. We are not going to hide from, as we don't at the American Adventure at Epcot Center in Florida, we're not going to hide from slavery. conflict. Well, slavery, Vietnam, uh, civil war, civil war uh, racial tension, uh, immigration, it's all part of the American story. It's also what makes us strong. So I, I, I can't say that it's, it's, it's a negative. It's, a, it's part of the whole pluralistic society that we're in. Alexandria, Virginia, hello. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Eisner, I'm a big fan of Disney and uh, of yourself, and I'm a supporter of Civil War battlefield preservation as well. And living in Northern Virginia, I'm concerned about the battlefields, and I was wondering what Disney uh, w is planning to doing with their development. Are they um, going to be concerned about the impact on Manassas and other Civil War battlefields? Do they plan fair to question. support preservation? It is a fair question. We are, no, we are, we are near the Civil War battlefields. We are near Manassas. We are not on top of it. We have not taken a historically sacred piece of land. We have taken a very beautiful piece of land. We, we have options on a very beautiful piece of land. And we are going to present for those 18 or 20 million people a year who come to Washington with their families to see the Vietnam Memorial and the Washington Memorial, and Lincoln Memorial, the White House and so forth, uh, Smithsonian, a separate day or a half a day trip uh, 35 minutes away to our version of America. Now hopefully our version of America will be, as I 
said many times, patriotic, but it will be one that shows everything. We will do some Civil War reenactment battles. We will show the Monitor and the Merrimack having their battle, Disney style. We will show a whole show on immigration in Ellis Island and the melting pot that this country has become. We will certainly do a lot on technology and the Industrial Revolution and America's place in it. And frankly, we will celebrate not only America, but we will celebrate that which separates us from everywhere else in the world, and that's our diversity. Do you think the people at the preservation might be worried about all that traffic coming through and that kind of thing? Uh, I did not know when I went to the entertainment business that one of the prime things that I'd have to think about was traffic. Uh, this was not something that I was taught as an English major or a theater major, and uh, you have no idea how much I talk about garages and double-decking parking and traffic. Yes, I think uh, not all... And I wait a lot of times in traffic in Los Angeles on the freeway, so I have total empathy for anybody you who... You get stuck in traffic? You, Michael Eisen, CEO of Disney, you get stuck? I think everybody gets stuck in traffic. Uh, at any rate, uh, we have sympathy for that. We, we understand that, and we are dealing with all the local authorities to make sure uh, it doesn't happen because of us. Eisner became obsessed with Disney's America. When he was being interviewed at the time, he was like a kid, bringing up the project even though the interview had nothing to do with the park. But just like in Long Beach and Paris, the citizens of Virginia pushed back. There are three reasons for the Disney's America Project's failure. With the help of American historians and the Washington Post, locals fought the idea of American history being Disney-fied. But Disney had no intention of presenting history through pixie dust colored lenses. Imagineer Bob Weiss once said about the park, This is not a Pollyanna view of America. We want to make you a Civil War soldier. We want to make you feel what it was like to be a slave, or what it was like to escape through the Underground Railroad. Michael Eisner said, We will show the Civil War with all its racial conflict. And a Disney official stated, The park will include painful, disturbing, and agonizing exhibits on slavery, American Indian life, and the Vietnam War, unlike the fantasy attractions at the company's other parks. You know, the three biggest missteps in American history, slavery, the treatment of indigenous people, and the Vietnam War. You know, for kids! Like in California, the Virginian government welcomed Disney, but the locals were hesitant, especially after the formation of the opposing group, Protect Historic America. A group of American historians who feared Disney's presence would disrupt the historic landmarks near the proposed site, such as the Battlefield of Manassas, just five miles away, and they worried Disney wasn't capable of educating guests properly. Locals followed the influence of these experts and joined the fight against Disney. They also didn't like the name Disney's America. They saw it as a statement that Disney thought they owned this country. The bad will created by the failures of France didn't help either. But the biggest blow of the project and the company as a whole came on Easter Sunday in 1984, when Disney president Frank Wells died in a helicopter accident. Wells was a structure that contained the tsunami that was Michael Eisner. He was the guiding force that steered Michael in the right direction, and with him gone, Eisner was lost. The studio head Jeffrey Katzenberg relentlessly pursued Wells' job almost immediately after Frank's passing. This put a bad taste in Eisner's mouth and demolished what little respect he had for Katzenberg at that point. Seeing no future with Disney, Katzenberg left and founded DreamWorks with friends David Geffen and Steven Spielberg. That's why it's DreamWorks SKG, Spielberg, Geffen, Katzenberg. Eisner and Katzenberg would continue to fight, especially at the box office. Katzenberg even greenlit Ants when he heard Disney and Pixar were making a movie about bugs called A Bug's Life. For a while, Eisner fought for Disney's America, but with the picketing against the park, the financial crisis thanks to Euro Disney, the drama behind the scenes, and the fact that the Virginian park would only be able to be open for eight months out of the year due to unbearable winters, Disney finally canceled Disney's America. It just wasn't worth the fight. In 1997, the Knott family considered selling Buena Park's Knott's Berry Farm to the Walt Disney Company. Disney saw this as an opportunity to revisit the Disney's America idea and convert the existing park into an amalgam of the original and the failed East Coast Historic Park. After seeing plans for Disney's renovation, the family changed their minds out of fear of Disney removing too much of what Walter Knott put into the park. So they sold it to the Cedar Fair Entertainment Company who changed it far more than Disney ever considered. Were you unprepared for the protests? Yeah, Disney lost on this one. The, the, that theme park was not built. For the moment, we lost. And we lost because we handled the entrance and the public relations and how we dealt with it badly. It was not any of the things you described. It was not a sanitized version of history. 
a history that is unknown to the highest percentage of American kids ever and a percentage that would just floor you as to how many kids don't know who our presidents were or what is the Declaration of Independence or what does it mean. Uh, they don't know who Thomas Paine is. They don't know who they don't know who Franklin Roosevelt is. They don't know. They maybe know who Jackie Kennedy was. It's they don't understand uh, American kids today. By and large, don't understand what is freedom and what is freedom of the press and what is basic human rights and things like that. So we were going to do a theme park, and still may do it. And 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 some of the theme park you will find in Disney's California near Anaheim when it's built because we had so many ideas that I think are valid and it was a great project and as well as the project was designed as good as it is and how it showed a country that grew out of diversity and grew out of pluralism and what that means and how well we did is how badly we handled ourselves going to Washington we had no idea and it was silly we should have known we had no idea the fear of Mickey Mouse and history, what, that, what those two images in one's mind would connote. We had no idea, even though we were five miles away from a battlefield, which I inadvertently called the Battle of Bull Run, which is the northern version of it, not really realizing that Virginia was even in the south, and you call it the Battle of Manassas. I mean, those kinds of things was simply insensitivity to a region of the country that I wasn't aware was so... Uh, sensitive. Uh, these mistakes buried it. These mistakes uh, created a backlash and gave the landowners who we were near all the fodder that they needed to uh, wage a effective lobby in a place where lobbying can be very effective against us. Yeah. And I got sick right in this period. Right, you had bypass. Right, right, right during this period, and when I got out of the hospital, and I found out it was six weeks more, we'd have to be closed in the winter because it was colder there than we thought, and the economics started going south, and politicians started going south, and rich people started going south. I decided I better go south, and we put it on we put it on hold. You know, something else you point out in your memoir is that the the title Disney's America was maybe not the best choice of titles because to some people it implied that Disney owned the country's history. And I guess that really gets to one of the biggest fears that people had, you know, that Disney's America would be like Disney rewriting history. So how how do you address a concern like that? I, uh, I'm too close to the fire. I'm a moth too close to the flame. Uh, I love the words Disney's America. I think it describes exactly what it is. It's a park. It's a park that teaches history using Disney techniques. I think the Museum of Tolerance or the Holocaust Museum, more accurately, in Washington, uses a lot of Disney technique. A lot of Disney people worked on that, all sorts of walkthroughs and and use of, of, of multimedia effects. That's what I thought it meant. I didn't think it meant that Annette Funicello was going to be the queen of America. Uh, but it was an unfortunate name in hindsight. I still think it sounds good because I, when I heard it in our development meetings, Disney's America. Well, that sounds perfect. That sounds what it should be. So when we developed the park in California to be next to Disneyland, and of course I would have immediately called it Disney's California, <laughs> better, better minds prevailed than we're now calling it Disney's, <laughs> Disney's California Adventure. <laughs> Not a good name, Disney's California Adventure. Disney's California, to me, says this is the view of California by Disney. Right. I mean, it's no different than Morrison and Cominger's, uh history of the United States. I mean, I don't think that sounds so bad. But the possessive Disney, which elicits a lot of Winnie the Pooh thoughts, didn't go well with... Uh, with uh, the Annenbergs, let's say, and other people that lived close by. After Anaheim won, Disney released more detailed plans for Westcott and the new Disneyland Resort to the public. The idea of an expanded Disneyland rubbed locals the wrong way. Traffic was already an issue for the city, and Westcott was going to be a bright park after sunset. The pain! 
The plans also included parking structures on property that Disney didn't own. This upset the land's owner. This was seen as arrogant and assuming on Disney's part. Disney did finally buy that property in recent years in hopes of building a parking structure, the one they canceled soon after. The city of Anaheim was willing to pay for the renovation of the surrounding area, what would become the Mickey and Friends parking structure and the freeway off-ramp that led to and from the structure. Due to budget cuts, many Disney park projects were canceled or scaled back. Disney's Animal Kingdom had the budget of 600 to 800 million, about the budget of Disney's America. The planned Tomorrowland 2055 became a copy and paste land of attractions from other parks, especially Epcot in Paris. Plans for Hollywoodland at Disneyland were cancelled as well as a Little Mermaid attraction, a Roger Rabbit attraction that would eventually become Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin, and a Dick Tracy ride after the movie flopped in 1990. The ride vehicles were repurposed for Indiana Jones and the Temple of the Forbidden Eye, which was also a compromise after the cancellation of the Young Indiana Jones stunt show, inspired by the opening of Last Crusade. Mickey Starland combined with ideas from Hollywoodland and became Mickey's Toontown. Disney moved forward with plans for a second Paris park after changing the name of the original to Disneyland Paris and investing what they could into fixing its initial mistakes. However, through the 1990s, the Disney decade wasn't anywhere close to what Eisner envisioned. And despite budget constraints, they knew that Disneyland did need expanding and a second park to compete with other Disney parks around the world and with local California attractions. Eisner loved taking retreats to Aspen, Colorado. In 1995, he brought a group of Imagineers to work out the Disneyland Resort problem. They came to the conclusion that guests visiting Disneyland would visit other California attractions during their stay in the state. So why not give them those experiences right next door to Disneyland? On July 17th, 1996, Disneyland's 41st birthday and the same day touched on release Kazam, Disney's president Paul Pressler announced plans for the expanded Disneyland Resort, including Disney's California Adventure. The name was probably selected so no one would criticize Disney for thinking they own the state. The plans for Disney's California Adventure in 1996 weren't entirely what we got with the park that opened five years later. We did get adaptations of the Hollywoodland idea that was planned for Disneyland, including a Hollywood Boulevard that looks very similar to the one in Florida, the River Raft Ride, Family Farm and Victory Field originally planned for Disney's America, and the State Fair Boardwalk idea from Disney's America and Disney Sea. Just like the 1998 renovation of Tomorrowland, Disney's California Adventure was a cut-and-paste park. We also got the park's icon of a mountain that looks like a bear-slash-wolf hybrid that guests insist is a wolf despite it being called Grizzly Peak. In 1996, Disney tried to use the spire from the remodel of Westcott at the entrance of DCA. They would eventually replace it with a giant hubcap. Hollywoodland, or Hollywood Pictures Backlot, would have featured an e-ticket ride where you were chased by paparazzi. But after the death of Princess Diana, it became a cheesy dark ride with lame celebrity animatronics. It also would have had a more interactive version of the animation building, closer to early Disney MGM attractions. Grizzly River Run would have had animatronic animals and a more exciting ending. Surf Beach or Surf City or what became Paradise Pier almost had surf lessons. However, before the construction of World of Color, Paradise Bay did have waves. The Golden Dream Show was a lot more exciting than the Whoopi Goldberg film we got in 2001. It was an updated version of Florida's American Adventure, but themed to California, of course. There was also going to be a replica of a garage where Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak invented the first Apple computer. From the dream makers at Disney. An exciting new theme park is coming to Southern California. Located right next door to Disneyland Park. Celebrating all the fun and adventure of California. Introducing Disney's California Adventure. A brand new Disney park. Opening February 2001.
months yet to come. Just ahead is the future home of Disney's California Adventure, an all-new 55-acre theme park and resort that celebrates the fun and diversity of America's Golden State. From the natural wonders of the California landscape to the glitter of Hollywood and the seaside amusement parks of yesteryear, Disney's California Adventure will offer a whole new world of discovery and entertainment. We hope you'll join us in 2001 to experience the magic of Disney's California Adventure. In just a few moments, we'll be making a brief stop at the Disneyland Resort Hotels, a home away from home for many of our Disneyland guests. In addition to the marina, gardens, and outdoor recreation, the resort hotels feature unique shopping, dining with the Disney characters, and award-winning restaurants. This is the stop for the Disneyland Hotel and the Disneyland Pacific Hotel. If you will be leaving us here, please gather your belongings, then exit the station toward the rear of the monorail. If you will be returning to Disneyland later, please be sure to keep your Disneyland passport and have your hand stamped as you leave the station. You may prior to Disneyland closing. For your safety, please remain seated until the monorail comes to a full stop. that you keep your hands and arms inside the cabin during our journey. Remain seated at all times, and no smoking, please. We're now en route to Tomorrowland on our own highway in the sky, which will give us a bird's-eye view of the Disneyland Resort. Since its opening in 1955, Disneyland has continued to grow and change, adding new shows, attractions, and even new lands. Just to the right of the train, in what is now the guest parking area, will be the biggest change yet. It's Disney's California Adventure, an entirely new resort area that will include a 55-acre theme park, a luxury resort hotel, and a bustling entertainment center. We hope you'll join us in 2001 to experience the newest generation in Disney entertainment. Main Street, USA, a nostalgic look at small town America as it was nearly a century ago.
dispatch. 10-4 control. To those of you who have just joined us, welcome aboard the Disneyland monorail. For your safety, we ask that you keep your hands and arms inside the cabin during our journey. Remain seated at all times, and no smoking, please. We're now en route to Tomorrowland on our own highway in the sky, which will give us a bird's eye view of the Disneyland Resort. Since its opening in 1955, Disneyland has continued to grow and change, adding new shows, attractions, and even new lands. Just to the right of the train will be the biggest change yet. It's Disney's California Adventure, an entirely new resort area that will include a 55-acre theme park, a luxury resort hotel, and a bustling entertainment center. We hope you'll join us in 2001 to experience the newest generation in Disney entertainment. To the left of the monorail is the main entrance of Disneyland. Beyond it is Main Street, USA, a nostalgic look at small-town America as it was nearly a century ago. Before we enter Disneyland, the engineer would like to say a few words. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Monorail Blue. Just a reminder, the park does close at 12 midnight tonight. that right how about a new theme park a new deluxe hotel and a new retail dining and entertainment zone when it opens in early 2001 the new Disneyland Resort will be the largest destination resort in Southern California Disney's California Adventure we look at it's kind of a sampler of the best of California we've taken the impressions that we think are most memorable of what the state is about Guests can still enjoy the fantasy and magic of Walt's original Disneyland Park or head next door to Disney's California Adventure and check out the fun and adventures of California Disney style. I always kind of check and see if Walt's going to be proud or not, but I, I know he'd love this. Disney's California Adventure is like stepping into a picture postcard of California. Guests can explore three distinctive districts, the Golden State, Hollywood Pictures Backlot, and Paradise Pier each providing a snapshot of the California dream. The Golden State is a place to sample the riches and diversity of California's landmarks and lifestyles. A land where you can go whitewater rafting, spend time in the Napa Valley, do a little hang gliding, or just hang out with Flick and his friends at the Bugs Life Theater. In the Hollywood Pictures back lot, guests will experience the magic of Hollywood firsthand. They can take a ride in the Superstar Limo, where everyone's a star. Go inside the world of an animator to see what it takes to create animation magic. Or kick back with Jim Henson's lovable Muppets at Muppet Vision 3D. Paradise Pier captures the excitement of California's legendary Oceanside Amusement Parks. Among the many new rides, the California Screamin' Roller Coaster. Zero to 50 miles per hour in four seconds, anyone? Or maybe you just want to catch the view from the spectacular sun wheel. To complete the Disneyland Resort experience, guests can stroll through Downtown Disney, the new energetic entertainment complex with a wide choice of dining, entertainment, and shopping. Oh, and if you were looking for a place to stay, if you thought the world-famous Disneyland Hotel and Disneyland Pacific Hotel were great places to check into, check out the new Disney Grand Californian Hotel. Located inside Disney's California Adventure, this deluxe hotel has the ultimate amenity for guests, a theme park outside their hotel room. The Disneyland you know and love is changing, big time. But then, that's what Walt Disney always said would happen. Well, there's a little plaque out there that says, uh, as long as there is imagination left in the world, Disneyland will never be complete. 